We could be anywhere, but we're in Miami. Then the Golden Girls lived in Florida, right? I think so. Where is the Golden Girls house? Oh, it's in LA. <laughs> Man, <laughs> the exterior. They didn't live in LA. The city of Miami has decimated its native forest. People come here and they plant all this tech. It's not native here. So we're bringing back the native trees. This will be my first time in the Everglades. Bogs and swamps give me the greatest amount of fear. But first, we're killing this lawn Pony Montana style. Say hello to our little friend. Now, some people may be watching at home and saying, hey, Al, isn't it dangerous to be using a steam pressure washer one-handed without looking? I've been arrested in Miami. I might still have a warrant. Oh, oh. Miami's kind of in a rough spot, man. It's like between the rising ocean and it's built on drained Everglades. To make room for Miami, developers erased most of the pine rocklands. In Miami-Dade County, 186,000 acres of forest created an ecological anchor for a community of 225 native plant species. Today, less than 2% of the forest exists outside of Everglades National Park. It's so wild that this all used to be pine rockland forest. Think of what that did to bird migration when all the habitat was cleared out. OK. Look at how this is nice. Look at this. It's all shady and stuff. This is nice in here. This seems kind of like a working class neighborhood. I don't want to puke yet. We're going to go see Charlie Reverte, a tech entrepreneur and volunteer advocate for native plants. This guy's a true believer. He restored his backyard to something resembling what once grew here naturally. Now he wants to kill more lawn out front and continue to fight to restore native microsite ecosystems in his native Miami. Get it. Hey, what's up? Hey, welcome. Welcome. Hey, thanks, Charlie. Great to meet you. Thanks for having us. So excited for you guys to be here. Thank you. We got little coffees for you. Oh, awesome. Thank you. How Miami. Yeah, it's how good. When in Rome. I was aware of Joey through his YouTube channel. And the first video I came across was Joey's Guide to Illegal Tree Planting, where he goes around town with a stolen scooter. He says it was ethically stolen and goes and plants trees in public places where he doesn't have permission. He got some coast live oaks. Clamp did it without any permission, but they seem to be doing fine. Again, the city kind of dropped the ball, so I don't think they mind too much. And to me, that idea was so inspiring. So I've done my own version of that. So with the front yard, like, what are some of the things that you want to do with it? So my goal with this restoration is to educate people about what Miami is really about. So when you think about Miami, you probably think about neon lights, nightclubs, and cocaine. Materialism mm -hmm. and bad cocaine, yeah. I was going to say. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's all like, what can we consume and what can we destroy? That's yeah. what Kill Your Lawn is trying to get at. Like, trying to get people, you know, instead of fighting where they live, you're becoming a part of it. Yeah. So I want to do a restoration of what would have originally been here, which would have been cypress waterline and then trees transitioning to a pine rockland. The sort of feature in a way anyone who drives by can see what what would have been here? So the dominant species would be the cypresses and then the slash mm -hmm. pine, the pines yeah. eliadia. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Let's go check out what you got in your yard. Let's do it. I'm going to be honest, you know, when I learned that the Golden Girls wasn't actually filmed in Miami, it was just set to take place, I was a little disappointed. Charlie's done his homework on this one, identifying which species contribute positively to the local ecology. These are staying. It's a gumbo limbo right there. A gumbo there. thing. And then we have some cabbage palms here. This is our state palm. So what are you going to do when you get rid of the lawn? Everything on the ground is going to get trashed. All these bushes, those non-native palms are all going to go. We also have an invasive fishtail fern. That's really gone out of control. So we're going to wipe all this out. And the idea is, think about this as a place you approach from the water, a native freshwater canal. So it's cypress along the water line, yeah, which like really helps. Like a cypress thing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. The cypress also prevent the erosion. They maintain the yeah. thick roots. Yeah. They're salt tolerant in case we get brackish water coming up mm -hmm. in a hurricane or as sea level rises. So they're really, really resilient species. And anyone who's worried about flooding on their property, an adult cypress can drink 800 gallons of water in one day. Whoa. Yeah. So it's a great way to reduce runoff. We're kind of using the landscape to act as like a large sponge. You know, if you pour water over a large sponge, it's not going to run off. It's actually going to soak into the sponge versus if you pour water on a big concrete slab, it's going to run right off. And all that wasted potential moisture. Charlie is a cypress planting pioneer in Miami who's not afraid of taking on City Hall. When I did the demolition of the backyard, we cut down a bunch of trees. 
All they care about is shade. They don't care about the native ecosystem. You heard that right. The city of Miami valued shade from non-native trees over the planting of native bald cypress trees. So you're like, you need to replace this many square feet of shade trees. And I put in a bunch of cypress. I'm like, oh, cypress aren't shade trees. I'm like, you're kidding me. I'm on the canal that would have been cypress. Would like to do a dramatic reading of your municipal warning, if, oh. you, if you don't. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Failure to comply. With this notice, within 30 days, Florida law authorizes the district to recover a civil penalty of up to $10,000 per day. And I had to convince them, and I got a council member, and now I can get credit for Cypress being shade trees if you're close to water only. Because of your advocacy of what you did on your property. Yeah. So what we're saying is we have work to do here in changing the yeah. entire culture. You have policies in place that are working against beneficial things that you're trying to do. That's right. So this will reduce erosion, so it saves them money. Uh, the, down there in that corner, they had to put in a seawall for millions of dollars. And if you just plant cypress, you don't need a seawall. You don't get the erosion, and it right. strengthens the banks. Right. This is why we have the Department of Unauthorized Forestry. That's what. We, so that's what we have to change, is right. get that mentality up top. To, yeah. Oh. So you got a bunch of native shit in your back. Let's go check it out, right? Let's go check it out. OK. A couple years ago, I got motivated to finally restore the backyard. So we had a huge stand of invasive Bishofia trees. It's really harmful for the environment. So we ripped them all out, and over the span of a couple of months, built a berm here to have pine rockland plants elevated in a ridge. It manages flood water away from the house and helps conduct it down into the aquifer instead of flushing it out to the bay. It's really filled in. There's a trail behind where my kids love to play in, and we have butterflies all day long. What we're talking about now is eco-zones. So you got pine rockland, which is the, the kind of drier, more arid micro sites with a different plant community versus what might be on the water. That's right. right? Charlie envisions his new front yard as a collection of micro sites, each home to plants that evolved in these specific types of habitat, whether in full sun out where there's now open lawn or down by the water in the shade of native palms and cypress. Anyone who's worried about flooding, especially here in low-lying Florida, and has king tides now, which is uh, sea level rise, <laughs> plant some cypress trees, they'll suck up all the water. But to be a good citizen, you want to keep the water on property. You want to put it in your trees. You want to go down into the aquifer. They're essentially redwoods of the southeast. To get the neighbors' attention and have some fun in the process, we plan to kill Charlie's lawn with a power tool not normally unleashed on unsuspecting lawns. To start this pressure washer, you know, I stole one looked like this once. It ended up being a problem because I had the GPS unit in it. I was, they, they could track you like that. They'll track they find you, you or did you bring it back before they got you? No, they didn't. No, we, it was a big ordeal. We had to, we made it out, but, you know, it was involved. Should we start it up? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, wow. With boiling water, it's going to steam and kill on contact. And then we're just going to smother it in mulch. The hot blasts of water rip into the St. Augustine grass, dismembering the lawn stolen by stolen, which are the grassy ground level shoots that allow the grass to spread. And similar non-toxic hot water blasters are used in eco-friendly agriculture. What you want to do is get in there real good. You gotta just spray the ferns real quick. You can get them. You're doing a good job. Thank you. Now, some people may be watching at home and saying, hey, Al, isn't it dangerous to be using a steam pressure washer one-handed without looking? And the answer is absolutely yes. Being a couple of union guys, Joey and I have perverted to our ways. I am the one laboring, and he is the one supervising. Yeah, he's doing a really good job. We mercilessly blasted Charlie's lawn with a power washer, and now it's ready for rebirth as a native plant show place. Who's this guy? I heard about this guy. This How's is how you Nice to meet you. We've seen your work in the backyard. The botanical maestro responsible for fully killing this lawn is Miami's top lawn assassin, Howard Tonkin. It was like The Bachelor interviewing a long list of different landscapers. I would tell them, uh, hey, here's an ecosystem diagram of Florida wetlands and different ecology zones, and they all looked like me you know, like I was crazy. And I talked to Howard, and I finally found someone crazier than I was, and it was a perfect fit. What we're going to be doing here is very, very much forest down to the shoreline. Bold cypress, pond cypress, Miami-Dade pine. You know, each tree has a different flower or a different berry or fruit, and that'll bring different birds. So you put all those trees back, 
the animals just show up. So, so everything's coming down except that gumbo limbo? The gumbo stays. Gumbo limbo, AKA Bursarus simaruba, develops unusual red bark that peels back, reminiscent of sunburned skin, which gives gumbo limbo the nickname a tourist tree. It endures blasts of salt water during king tides, and it withstands the wind during hurricanes nice. So you're recreating ecosystems, basically, yeah. whether it's a forest or pine rockland savanna or, or wetland. Absolutely. We're gonna be leaving out some of the mid-range heights to open up the vista, mm -hmm. so have more skinny, tall things, and then lower things, you know, a couple of hundred species of native plants. Out towards the front, we're gonna be cognizant that the client wants a front garden feeling, something more controlled looking to be more commercially appealing to the neighborhood. They might freak out on the forest, total forest look that we have back there. <laughs> it's dangerous. <laughs> yes, well, yes. <gasps> First to go, the non-natives. In her place will be the original residents of the Pine Rockland landscape, including a species that's pretty much vanished from suburban Miami, Amorpha crenulata, the crenulated lead plain. The killing part is fun, hanging out in the suburbs isn't so fun, but that's why we're gonna go out to a spot that makes us feel nice, where there's not many people and there's not many cars, and there's more, you know, some of the crumbs of native landscape that have been left. And amongst these crumbs, we shall find maybe some nice plants to bring back Yeah, here. that's where we go and get the ideas. We're hitting up two locations to see different examples of microsites Charlie plants to restore in his yard. We're here at Pinecrest Gardens, which is a little crumb of habitat. Charlie's property is just down Snapper Creek from here. Can you believe this is what it looked like before it was suburbanized? Little turtle, you see him down there? Look, there's two that got friends. If I could be anything, I would be a little turtle in a pen. We're here looking for the cypress trees that are gonna show us what Charlie's gonna plant along the banks of the canal, and they're gonna hold the banks together. They're gonna prevent erosion and create that waterside ecosystem. See, they put these in so you can't like a personal injury claim, you can't fall over, you know? I mean, the rocks themselves look like they offer an opportunity for a personal injury. Look at all the cypress knees, you see that? Yeah. These wooden protrusions sticking out the ground right here, those are called cypress knees, and they're protrusions from the roots of this tree, the bald cypress. The old thinking was that they used to help the roots acquire oxygen, but I don't think that's what's going on. It's probably helping give structural support to the root system to prevent the tree from blowing over. So, I mean, you can see why the root structure looks like that. It's got that fluted base, those trunk buttresses. Those are providing structural support, much like a beautiful Gothic yeah, cathedral, those, like Our Lady of Perpetual Sorrows Basilica over on Garfield Boulevard. Right, exactly. All right, this has been nice, but I want to go see some habitat. Let's, let's get, go. Let's go somewhere let's a little more, a little more wild, a little less cultivated. It's time to go to the next spot and see some plants. South Miami. Hurtling through the suburbs. You want to drive on the grass? Just God, I wish. We're meeting my friend, field biologist Lydia Cooney, at a Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden. Her conservation work takes her into preserves throughout Miami-Dade County, like the Deering Estate, which is one of the few slivers of Pine Rocklands left in the area. Yeah, we're gonna see this lead plant popping up. Lydia is the real deal, and thanks to her work, endangered native plants like the crenulated lead plant, Amorpha crenulata, still have a chance to survive. Why is this obscure little plant worth saving, you might wonder? The lead plant is meant to be here. It's estimated that a few years ago, there were only 100 crenulate lead plants left in the world. Miami has a lot of housing pressures to develop our natural environment. If there's any way that we can put native plants back into the landscape by using our yards, it's a win for us because native plants are low maintenance and it's a win for the plants because they get some of their habitat back. So we're getting into the pine rockland. Pines! Pines! <laughs> He's happy amongst the pines. Don't can it, let it out. Don't keep it bottled up, you know? We augmented the population of the crenulate lead plant. It's just in one of two places in the wild, and it's been introduced into about three or four places. So down to just 10 locations is very endangered, only found in Miami-Dade County. So we grew this plant out to purposely reintroduce it, augment the population that's here at the Deering Estate. They're very attractive when they are blooming, and the flower spike is really elegant with several flowers. They're white, or they can be purple, and they're a great pollinator attractor. So. Flowers are bangers is what we're saying. The flowers are real 
they get me jazzed. They look real nice. So you kind of help people get started in planting a native garden uh, at their house. Yeah, especially a pine rockland garden. Especially pine rockland, because that's yeah. the most damaged and removed mm -hmm. landscape. Yes, there, there's been 98% of the pine rockland has been developed at least. Wow. Yeah. It used to cover about 180,000 acres. Now we have very few left. Yeah, they left only crumbs, yeah. Wow, this is so cool. Thank you for taking us out here. Oh, this is nice. Look at it. This Look is at nice. It. A complete revolution. Take a look at Charlie's yard now. Can you believe Howard started this transformation just a few days ago? Wow, you got a lot done. We did. Holy How many different species we got here? Like 15, 20? By the time we're all done, there'll be probably around 150 to 200 species of plants. We were talking with Charlie about the lead plant, too. It just like has like a super rare plant. There's none of that available in any of the nurseries right now. So Amorpha it's got to be from, yeah, from some specialized grower. Our friend Lydia, she's growing a bunch of them. I think we're going to try to find one. Oh, so. my God, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And it would be so simple, right? If we could just plant that plant everywhere, it wouldn't be going extinct. Yeah. Like, no brainer. To learn more about endangered native plants and how they support the web of life in South Florida, we meet up with the legendary naturalist, Roger Hammer. You know, Roger's written, you know, 12 or 13 books, and so I can't think of a better tour guide for the flora of South Florida than him. Whoa. Yeah, look at this, a verdant green paradise. A secret garden, if you will. He created an oasis. Seeing Roger's garden helps us imagine what Charlie's yard will become, which is a functioning piece of the wild ecosystem. All these native plants, most of them were brought here by migratory birds. Just by planting these plants, you know, you're going to attract birds right. that are moving through. You know, you kind of form these stopover places, or if enough people do it, you form a corridor for migratory birds to move through. Rather than pushing all of nature out, you're bringing nature home. You know, it's a habitat. Uh, we've had Cooper's hawks in this here. Cooper's hawks winter in South Florida, where they fly around occasionally ripping the heads off of doves, starlings, and pigeons. Cooper's hawks are an indicator species, meaning if they're around, then the ecosystem is mostly intact. And if you want to see what Charlie's really going for in his yard, you got to visit the Everglades. Is this something we could do? Yeah. We're going to head there now. Woo! We're going to go check out some native habitat. I did not bring my bog shoes. You didn't bring your clocks? I kind of that up. This may not be the time to reveal it, but of all the things in the natural world that give me the greatest amount of fear, mm -hmm. I think bogs and swamps are one of them. Oh, really? I, I'm oh, shit. Well, you don't got to go on a I can carry you. When there were only two sets of footprints. I was carrying you through the bug. Man, being able to learn about the Everglades from Roger is so cool. See the leaves on pond cypress are oppressed. Mm -hmm. You know, Rolling. all cypress would be spread out like a feather. The most misunderstood national park in the nation. Yeah. It's like coming out here to get what it's all about and why it's so special. And when I was out here once with Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, I asked her, what do you think so special out here? And she stood there for so long, I didn't think she heard me. And then she finally said, did you hear that red-shouldered hawk out there? And then she said, do you see those egrets? And it was one of those moments, you know, yeah. that you don't need to say anything more. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> you know? It's cool, too. I mean, wetlands are so important in terms of just, like, the, the function they serve. This is basically a huge basin. Yeah, this is where the water comes from for Miami. Mm. You know, I mean, this is what's recharging Biscayne Aquifer, and without it, I don't think Miami could exist. Back in Miami at Charlie's Place, it's almost time to plant one of the rarest natives of all. That's incredible. Yeah. That's such an amazing addition to the project. Charlie's Yard is now one of the few places in South Miami with an endangered lead plant. Where are you going to put the lead plants? We had a couple of locations, like maybe down in here. It's a little moist. And then I was thinking, probably, They like it kind of dry, probably, though, huh? I think that they do like some moisture. I would say anywhere in the pine kind of areas. Uh, Even someplace here where they get a little bit more sun, because their whole tribe of the pea family tends to have decent storage roots, you know? So they can dry out a little. I've had it do best where it gets full sun in the morning and yeah. then shade in the afternoon. Oh, OK. Man, this mulch is a little rich, I think. It might be too rich. Too rich? 
We're in Miami, everybody's too rich or too poor, you know? <laughs> you like that? Beautiful in its new home. There it is. It's so happy. Another lead plant restored. Planting at Charlie's has made us want to see what this yard will look like in 20 years. So Lydia told us about this guy, Dr. Raul, who's got an extensive native plant garden. So this is a Morpha crenulata, critically endangered lead plant. Yeah. And these are rescues from the late 90s from Miami. The population there is extinct. Really? What happened to it? They built something there? They just housing, just God, suburbia. Man. Suburbia came and just took it all away. I love what you're doing here. It's really important. You don't see many people taking this time and dedication to planting native. And you know everything, too. I can tell you love it. It's my hobby and my therapy. Uh. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for showing us around your garden. Amazing work. Decades of planting and tending to it. And thank you all for doing what you do, because it, it brings all these things to people's minds. After a week of hard work, a little slice of native pine rockland habitat emerges from Miami's manicured streets. So one thing about the forest is like you see tiny little specimens of so many species, like in an area that big, you could have like 75 species or something. So, yeah, it's you know, crazy. You kind of emulate that in the garden. Yeah, this is so packed. It is like having gone out to the Everglades and see how dense it is. Yep. This is that same density. I know these plants are on the small side now, but give it some time. Besides, it's better to plant more smaller trees than a few spaced out big ones, because when clusters of saplings have to compete, they grow faster and develop stronger root systems. I love it. This is going to be really yeah, good man. to see. I hope you'll send me pictures in six months. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm really happy with how it came out. And six months from now, it will just be a blaze of color. Here we are amongst your newly planted pines. This is amazing. I really want to thank you guys. You guys gave a ton of great inspiration for the garden. Yeah, it's really reaches it's beyond all my goals of make something amazing that supports nature and also shows other people how awesome their yards can be. The yard is now home to keystone species on a waterfront, the full sun, and the pine forest microsites around the yard. Miami Dade slash pine, Pinus eliadii variety densa, bald cypress, Taxodium disticum, pond cypress, Taxodium ascendens, and most important of all, some endangered plants like the Kunti cycad, Zamia integrifolia, and a crenulated lead plant, Amorpha crenulata. I mean, I'm really impressed with how this turned out. It looks so, it looks so much better than it did. I mean, Howard's done an amazing job down in the mulch. I don't know what his neighbors are like, though. You know, they might put up some resistance, but the, you know, Charlie's a smart guy. He'll be able to fight it off. I think Charlie's going to tell the story of what he's doing. I think people are going to really respond. It's town by town, neighborhood by neighborhood, lawn by lawn.